Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening to you. Thank you for joining me this evening. I'm Larry Weathers, and this is Larry Weathers Live, and I want to thank all of you for coming in, and I see you all gathering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and to all of our global viewers, thank you for uh, hanging out with us and taking time. I know sometimes the hour is completely different for you, so I tremendously thank you. And for those of you all that reach out to let me know that you are engaging uh, this broadcast, it means the world to me. Thank you for everybody that is domestic right here in these United States of America. Thank you for joining me this evening. Listen, come on in this room tonight. I have some things to talk about and some things to discuss around this movie, Honk for Jesus. Will you do me a favor, which I know you're doing it, and I know you guys are so faithful and diligent in it. Will you share this broadcast with somebody? Text your friend. Let them know that you are present and you need them to be present. Send a DM right now. Email smoke signal. Call them. Text them. Run by their house real quick. If they write down below you in another apartment, bang on the floor and tell them they need to check this out because I believe that this is going to uh, be somewhat of commentary, but also maybe provide some answers and clarity, but hopefully will incite you to think a little differently about this film and even the body of Christ. Uh, I, hey, Sashel, I did it. I think you were the first person. <laughs> that recommended that I do it. And so, uh, and here I am. At first, I wasn't going to say anything. I was going to let it ride. And then I said, you know what? No, no, no. I need, I need to speak to this, not from just a controversial, sensational way, which it's okay if people want to do that. That's not me. Uh, and I think you have to get to know me to know what kind of person that I am, that I don't do anything just to get attention or I don't do anything just to get views and likes. Quite honestly, I don't expect a lot of views and likes with half of the things that I say. And so please understand that my motivation is simply to dispense truth, to speak truth. And for individuals that are not believers to hear competence and clarity and a practical side to being saved and being what we call ourselves believers of Jesus and then to the church in an apostolic way to speak to things uh, with a, with an intent that order would come, structure would come, reformation would come, that we can be the best representation of Jesus. And so what I say many times with regard to the church may be difficult to hear or digest, but please understand I'm only this passionate because I love the church. See, real enemies of the church to me are not Hollywood. Real enemies of the church to me are not screenwriters. Real enemies of the church is not even Satan worshipers to me. Real enemies of the church to me are those that are comfortable and complacent with the church being a mockery of what Jesus died for and it not being talked about as it should and those that actually could hold others accountable are silent. So when my passion is turned up, it is not because I hate the church or I'm an enemy of the church. Jesus said it this way, whom he loves, he chastens. And many times the sign of love is that correction. It is trying to get something back to its proper place. And I don't claim to have the answers to everything, but I'm also not you know, dismissing or diminishing what God has given me and the wisdom and the knowledge and revelation from observation and then the prophetic gift God has given me. So I want to encourage many of you uh, to stop dismissing what you see. I want to say that. Stop dismissing what you see because you don't have a title or you don't have a position or you don't have ordination certificates and papers. Those things are okay in their place, but that is not the qualifier for you to see and sense. All right, so I want, I want, you, to, I want you to stop dismissing it because many of you are spot on, but because you don't have status, 
in church circles, then you're quiet about what you see. And many times you'll hear people and you'll listen to people. Some of you all reach out to me and you thank me for saying what you've been saying in your own personal circle, in your own personal influence network. But I want you to be more bold and I want you to speak up. And many of you have been anointed to be reformers. You've been anointed to bring change in the body of Christ. And I want you to flow in that with confidence and with no apology. And if I can encourage five of y'all <laughs> to step up and do what you've been called to do, I believe God will be pleased with my life and uh, I will have achieved some purpose on this planet. All right. So good to see y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank y'all for coming in. I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate you all so very much. Listen, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know others will come in, but I want to, I want to start with giving you kind of what I'm going to deal with tonight. I'll be on about an hour or so, so it's not going to be real long, but I want to talk about why so many people are angry. I'm going to talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about this complicit nature of first ladies. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to deal with that this evening. And then I'm going to talk about solutions. All right. So I'm going to deal with the real reason so many people are angry, especially apostles and bishops and pastors, and the reason they're trying to make sure nobody sees this movie. Uh, number two, I'm going to deal with the complicit nature of so many first ladies and the damaging effect it has had in the body of Christ. And then lastly, I'm going to deal with a few solutions that I think we can do immediately that would possibly turn some of this around, especially with how the world looks at us. One thing that when I watch the movie and, and I'm also cognizant that everybody hasn't seen the movie, so I'm not trying to spoil it for you, but the movie to me was excellently done from the perspective of what they were attempting to accomplish. They nailed it. Now, personal preference and taste of the content or what was happening in the movie, well, that's that's left up to everybody, and that's a relative to say the movie was good or bad. But I looked at this movie. I knew what I was going into. I knew that it was meant to be satire and parody, so I knew what I was going into. But I also knew that with executive producers like Jordan Peele, I also knew with the director who has also done some other things along this line, I knew that I would need to pay attention to some very key points in the movie that would actually bring the substance and depth that so many people are claiming it doesn't possess. There were little nuances that were happening in the movie. One of those was a tambourine. And, and the tambourine was playing and it was in the background, but it was almost subliminal. And as the tambourine was playing, things were playing out. It was like the tambourine was signaling what should happen next. That was deep because it was showing the manipulation of what we've done with praise and we turn praise into something that can be signaled by the tambourine, the music. When we hear it, we go into motion. When we hear it, something else happens. When we hear it, we, we give God a praise. Praise him right now. Come on, give him glory. And, and we turned it into an action rather than a mindset. It was also signifying, and I don't have time to get into all of that because we'll be here all night, but, there, but seeing that motif throughout the movie, that caught my eye. Something else caught my eye is when they had the scene in the church and the little girl started shouting and dancing. The preacher came down. The bishop laid hands on the little girl. The little girl started speaking in tongues. And there were many that were angry at the mockery of speaking in tongues. And, and I got past all that. It's a movie, okay? Uh, I've seen people in actual church services faking speaking in tongues, and we tolerated that, and nobody stopped that. So th that didn't phase me in the movie. What, what was interesting, and I think a lot of people miss this because a lot of activity was still going on in the background. The little girl was looking in the camera, and she said, I love theater, and I do theater at school. And then she kind of smiled. Now, it seemed she was having this moment. It, it seemed so real for the movie's sake. And I know for us, we, we knew that it wasn't real. But for the movie's sake, they're having a moment. And, and the preacher is, is getting a sign of validation because a child, a child has just received the Holy Spirit. And when I laid hands on her, she was overcome by the power and presence of God. 
But the little girl said, I, I take theater at school and I love theater. So the suggestion was not that she was just acting. The suggestion was, did the pastor put her up to it? Because the pastor knew that she was in theater, did he feed her the lines? Did she have that answer that he asked the question? Because this was done beforehand, behind scenes. And I really wish I could say that that's just a movie. <laughs> but it's not. I've experienced that. I experienced that even as a child. There were certain signals we would be given. And at that moment is when we were supposed to dance or shout. Uh, before I started preaching, I started preaching at age 15. And before then, uh, I was a teenager and, you know, uh, well, actually preteen. I was 10, 11, 12 years old, and I would testify good. That's what they called it. That boy can testify, testify good. Well, I was halfway preaching, and I'd testify for 30 minutes. And and it would just flow out of me. I could talk, and, and, and I knew the word of God. I memorized whole chapters. I could quote whole chapters of Romans, just verbatim, back to back. I spent hours in the word. That's what I did as a kid. We couldn't do anything else, couldn't go to the movies, couldn't play sports. And so all I had time to do was read. Uh, and I would get up and, and they, boy, he testifying good. Well, we'd go out of town to churches. And when it came time uh, for, for little Larry to perform, I'd be given a signal from the pulpit or from the floor. And once I got that nod, it was understood I was to testify. I was to perform. And I'd get up and do it. And the church would go up and the people would dance and they would praise God. My own personal experience. That was not a genuine moment where I felt in this moment, I just want to give God praise. It was already pre-mastered before the service. And we saw that right there in that movie. And this is why when I labeled this, I said it's an actual documentary. And because it was so outlandish, there's so many people that have never experienced any of those things. So when they watch the movie, it seems to be there's no way this is real. And they see it as trash because they can't believe any of those things happen. There are some of us, and I think someone even put under uh, this notice that I was doing this, that it should have had a trigger warning to it. Because many of you that have watched it and will watch it, you definitely can relate to, I'm talking verbatim things that happened in that movie, and it wasn't funny for you. It wasn't comedic for you. And as I watched this movie, it started dealing with some things that I have actually witnessed, I've been a part of, I've engaged, I've seen it happen over and over and over. So when I saw those little nuances in the movie, it allowed me to know there's something deeper that is happening here. And what really blew my mind was Hollywood was able to decipher, discern what these things are in the church and what's being done. They were able to discern it, present it in a way that they knew if it wasn't comedy, most people would never see it. So you ever heard the term crying to keep from laughing? That there was an aspect to the movie. It's very dark. So it really should have been called dark comedy because there were some serious things that were happening in this movie. But they knew if we come right out and say it, the masses won't even watch it because it has to do with church. And I'm telling you what I felt when I was watching this thing. I said, you know what? There's something deeper here. Now, I'm not one to try to make, you know, something deep just to be deep. But when I view artistry and genius, and I believe that many of the individuals that were responsible for this, I believe are prophetic and I believe have prophetic gifts. I believe Jordan Peele is a prophet. I believe no one possibly has gotten to him to direct it. And maybe they have. I just don't know that. But I do believe that he sees and I believe he has a third eye, uh, not from the places that that many call a third eye that has to deal with some of the, the cults and some of the uh, organizations that that laud that. But when I say third eye, I'm talking about having that discernment that only God can give that where he allows like he did John the Baptist is y'all know Venetian blinds, uh, how that they, they can be parted. 
I, I think there are individuals that God parts the blinds and lets them peek into the future and then he closes the blinds back very quickly. And so they're not able to get a clear picture because the Bible says we prophesy and we see in part and we prophesy in part. Here, are there, here a little, there a little. That there, there are things that are that are dark and fuzzy, but we're able to see movement. And then it's left up to interpretation by one's gift to come back like John did. And John, when he saw what he saw, he could not put that into proper words. How can you describe heaven? John was limited in his ability to even speak and write, and so he did the best he could based on the competence he had as a human being. But in no way is John saying literally everything you read in Revelation is literally what I saw. He said, I got a quick picture, man. And when I saw that, here, here's the best I can tell you. So I think that that happens many times with producers and directors. I believe they're called of God. I believe they have an anointing on their lives. And I believe that God is sovereign. He can get out of anything, whatever he wants. And when I watched this movie, as I was watching it, it hit my spirit. This is actually going to bring people to Jesus. I didn't say the church. I said to Jesus. And there'll be testimonies of people not even understanding how they came to Jesus by this movie. God is sovereign. So why are so many people upset? Why are so many people angry. Uh, and, and, and why are so many bishops and apostles just, I mean, fuming? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they literally saw themselves watching that movie. See, here's the thing. He, they, they know that if this scene is going to be talked about by the masses, here's what they know. And these are things that my armor bearers, that my ministry leaders have watched me do, have heard me say, have walked in my house and saw my closet like that, have watched me go in debt to get tailored suits while the roof is leaking at the church who know that I'm putting on airs and pretending to have all this materialism, but but I'm actually using the social security numbers of people at the church and I, I'm involved in fraudulent behavior as it relates to things in the ministry. See, the issue is they know, what if the people from church watch this movie? And what if them seeing it, not from the bishop or the apostle, in these atmospheres and environments that are highly controlled and manipulated and the brainwashing that occurs. When you get someone out of that environment and they're able to see it without a filter over them, they can come to clarity and understanding. That's why so many are angry. You mean to tell me a movie? You're that mad about a movie? with all of the mess that is going on in your present reformation that you're a bishop in, and you never talk about that, you never make a Facebook post about that, you never speak up about the atrocities that are happening in your reformation, but the minute a movie comes out, now you're dedicating a whole Facebook post to it? You, you, will, not, you will not blast a known predator that, that is your friend and in the bishopric with you, you won't call them by name, but you will call by name the actors in this movie? When you start to get freedom in your life, any inkling of bondage will make you physically sick. I'm a witness. If, if I'm talking right, will, will somebody... Lay on those hearts and give me some. I need some hearts tonight. I need to know y'all with me and I'm not here by myself. Now, y'all know I don't mind standing alone and by myself. But tonight, can y'all help me a little bit? Can y'all give me some hearts? If you have experienced that once you get free, any inkling of bondage, manipulation, control, narcissism, sexism, 
it will make you physically sick. And this is why so many individuals who are caught up in this kind of control never want you to see anything that would expose the things they're doing. Watch me in a different light than what they've taught you it is. And so now you're seeing pastors and bishops, apostles, they're, they're angry. But you're angry, sir. You're angry, ma'am, because you know there are those that have witnessed that behavior in you. And rather than you say, you know what, you guys, I have been doing this wrong. I've been approaching this the wrong way. Actually, what y'all saw in that movie, it seems so outlandish because it is outlandish. I should never be in a situation where I'm trying to make a decision which Prada to wear, periwinkle or otherwise, when I'm looking at my church is going through calamity because of something I created. That I should not be trying to think of the next catchy gimmick, honk for Jesus, okay? The whole point of that, y'all, with the black Jesus, we're talking black uh, liberation theology was woven into the movie. We're now talking about marketing gimmicks and how foolish they look to the outside world. And people are missing it. They're missing that the things we're doing make us look so desperate. Rather than be practical, rather than just engage people, we're always looking for that next gimmick. We're always looking for the thing that's going to set us apart from the church down the street, not understanding. And of course, y'all y'all know my, my whole company and agency is on marketing and branding. There's nothing wrong with that, but gimmicky when you're after gimmicks. Gimmicks are quick fixes. Pastors, if you're hearing me, marketing and branding are supposed to be part of a strategy. They're not the strategy. They're part of your strategy. Many of you are making marketing and branding the complete strategy for growing your church. It doesn't work that way. You're supposed to be creating a community for people to feel loved and accepted and safe no matter who they are, no matter their sexual orientation, no matter their gender identification, no matter their color of their skin, no matter their class, no matter their social standing, you're supposed to be creating a culture of whosoever will let them come. That is actually the mission of growing a church. Marketing and branding are part of that overall strategy strategy. So they were showing in the movie how ludicrous it looks for you out there in a three-piece suit, first lady out there in a hat, honk for Jesus. They were trying to show the great chasm from what you all are even out there dressed in versus trying to be cool and trying to be relevant with a honk for Jesus that, that it wasn't fitting And the movie continued to deliver things that I have literally witnessed over and over and over. I've been a part of two churches and one very large ministry, mega church, actually there in Atlanta where, where that movie was shot. And we could see the church and, and know that church well where the movie was shot. But I had an opportunity to be a part of a ministry that was going through scandal and just coming out of scandal. And Pastor E and I were called to go there and assist and to help out and help that transition. But unfortunately, individuals that had the opportunity to do things the right way and to be honest about it chose not to and ended up losing everything. It was a shame. And being up close and personal, watching people say, I know we could allocate funds there that would be a blessing to people, but if we do that, I won't have a limousine service. So let's not feed them at church. Whatever you do, don't touch my limousine service, but you've got four cars that you can drive at any moment. See you all, sometimes people don't see behind the scenes. And God has given opportunity for repentance. Look how many years has gone by and nothing really has ever come out that, that grand about the church. Hillsong, the documentary that just came out a few, uh, a few months ago, uh, was a scathing review 
of what has been going on in many of us that have been in certain circles and, and traveling and preaching. I've been doing this for years. We've we've witnessed a lot of things. I've pulled away from a lot of places because of the things that were going on. And now, though, in this social media age, nothing will be hidden. This is not a prophecy. I prophesied some stuff about six years ago and those things came to pass. But now we're just in an age where nothing will be hidden. All is being revealed from sex tapes to to people cussing in the pulpit in straight up messages to people having uh, manic episodes literally while preaching and singing. Y'all, some of what we're seeing is not demonic. It's manic. It's mania. It's mental breakdown. It's mental illness on display. What we've called sometimes Baptist fit. And they shouting where individuals slipping into mental illness moments that should have been administered and helped with medication, not oil poured on them. And when you start talking this way, people get nervous because you start exposing the foolishness. How can we be this mad about a movie when in real life, we see it play out. Y'all watch people you knew were fake. It wasn't the Holy Ghost. It wasn't the anointing of God. You watch people try to outsing somebody else. One up somebody else. This preacher preached while well, the person coming behind them trying to outdo them. You've watched the gimmicks with money and the fake seed offerings and consecration offerings and and I sowed this seed and God moved on my behalf. I believe in sowing. I don't believe in sowing to make God do anything. And the reason God would never allow that is because we would manipulate it and try to control it. God's not a vending machine. You don't put money in and then get what you need from God. That's a lie. When I sow, I sow because I believe it's done. Or I sow as an extension of me because I can't give God my arm. I can't give God my legs. I can't physically lay down on an altar and give God my, my physical body. But I, but I work and as I work, I make money. But I didn't make that money until I worked. I put my body in a position for so many hours a day to create income. I lent my body to that. So when I give my money, it's an extension of me. That's why whatever you give to, you should be very sagacious and discerning because it's not just the money you gave, it's you that you gave. You just came in partnership with whatever you gave money to. You, you're, you're there, not just your money. So when I give an offering, I'm giving me because he said, present your body, I want you. So when I sow, it is never about what God is going to give me. And when preachers tell you, you need God to do something in your life, you need God to move in your life, how many of y'all need a financial miracle? Well, I dare you tonight. So give your last and watch what God's going to do. No, you're going to get blessed, preacher, because you got five people to give $1,000. So you know 5,000 is coming before you get to the general take. If people want to have things happen financially, they need to get their credit together. If you want more money, spend less and increase your income. Get a second job. Get a third job for a season. Voila! You'll have more money. If you want to drive a certain car, live in a certain neighborhood, then determine ways that you can create that those streams of income. You need at least five to seven that can sustain you. And then you live beneath your, your means so that you can have money to save. But there are ways that you can become financially successful and you're not sitting around waiting on a miracle or cause you sow the seed. We don't give for that. So these tricks, these gimmicks are making the world look at us and say, you're foolish. You're a parody. You're a comedy church of the living God. And we're so blind, we get angry when someone exposes it. You know, I, I, I had 
I had in a, in a comment someone had made, I can't even remember right now who made it, but I made, someone made a comment and I put under that comment, the sad part is somebody somewhere is planning a service or a special revival because their rent is due. Some pastor, some apostle, some bishop, personal rent is due, credit card is due, <laughs> card note is due. So we're going to call a special service. God is calling us to revival, saints, for the next two nights. I need everybody here and bring a special seed. Well, it's around the first of the month, Reverend. That rent's due. <laughs> and this, this prostitution of people and their hard-earned money and their faith and confidence in us as clergy, it is sadistic, it is demonic, and the judgment of the Lord has begun in the church. God is not judging the world. If you read the Bible, we're supposed to actually judge the world. The Bible says judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And God has started doing that. And you may say, well, pastor, I don't see churches closing down. Well, many are. I'm telling you they're closing down. You just don't know about it because launches are loud. Closings are, are very soft. They're quiet. Many churches are closing down. Many churches are saying we're going online because their, their church no longer exists. They don't have anything to pastor. We're watching whole reformations be torn to pieces. We're seeing the judgment of God coming through, anointing that used to be on people's voice. See, I'm listening keenly this year, not in a judging way of that person is no longer anointed. <clears throat> excuse me, anointed. That's not what I mean. But I'm being careful who I'm let talk to me about the things of God. Is your sound processed? Is your sound born out of purification, but born out of adversity? What have you mastered? Stop preaching struggle to me. I'm already struggling. If I'm going to listen to you, I don't need companionship or camaraderie from you. I need solutions and competence from you. Come on, preachers. Remember when first lady was sitting on the front row and he said, I gave him all. That's all I got. She said, mm, that, that wasn't it. See, sometimes that's the gauge for how a sermon has landed. Did it make people move? Did it make them jump? Did it make them say amen? I'm going to tell you when you really hear a riveting word from God, sometimes you can't move. That thing is so heavy. It's like someone dropped weights in your stomach and held you there. We need more of that gut wrenching preaching that makes you think, makes you change. I appreciate Daniel. I appreciate the three Hebrew boys. But, but quite honestly, I'm not trying to hear that all the time. And, and so I said, God, then if, if this is what's going on with the church, how did we get here? How did we get here? And, and I'm going to show you something that's about to blow y'all's mind. And I thank y'all for sharing because whoever's on right now, uh, you're about to see something that some of you have never seen before in your entire life. And I'm going to show you something uh, because it lends to what I'm saying about the things that we're seeing done in the church that God has a problem with. I want to show you this scripture. Jesus entered the temple. Y'all remember when Jesus is, is whipping out the money changers? He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs. I taught this about seven years ago and I'll never forget. I did it on Facebook live about seven years ago. And there are people that had never even, they never knew chairs was in this verse because all they've heard preached on was flip the tables. I'll never forget. I was reading it and it's like chairs just went 3D on the page and I had to go do study it again. When I shared this, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> the response, but it says, not only tables, but Jesus knocked over the chairs of those selling doves. So he's in the temple. He sees the chairs. He sees the tables. He sees the activity. Watch. Because there were people sitting in the chairs, people at the tables that were doing things that were ungodly, unseemly. So Jesus goes and flips them over. Jesus did not flip over the tables and chairs just because he was mad. I've heard people use this text for indignation and, and you're partially correct, but he flips it over to suggest reformation, reformation. 
formation. Somebody type that into a thread for me. So y'all remember that live? Somebody said, you remember that flipping? Yeah, yeah. And and put put in the thread and space RE, then put space form, space A-T-I-O-N, reformation. He flips it to show this should not be in my house. This activity should not be here. So I'm flipping it to let you know I don't want it like this in my house. Now watch this. If he flips it and you go back and set the tables and the chairs back up, what message have you given him? Now, this is where you're about to get messed up. All right. When you look at this text, now we know the New Testament is written in Greek, Old Testament, Hebrew. The word for chair here. You ready? That's the Greek word for chair that is used in that passage. Cathedra. Mm -hmm. The English word pronounced the same way spelled with the C is a bishop's official throne. So the chairs that the pastor and his wife were sitting in are called cathedras. The chair that Jesus overthrew in the temple was a cathedra. If Jesus flipped over a cathedra, we have cathedras on stage and in pulpits. I know, I know, and I know I'm going to get in trouble right here. I understand that. But you want to know why parodies are made of us? Because people that don't even claim to be believers know Greek. People that don't claim to be full of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues know Hebrew. And they understand how to look at scripture and they do something called rational exegesis which a lot of people don't understand, exegesis is varied. There is the exegesis that comes from spiritual, divine uh, in, you know, inspiration, but there's what we call geographical exegesis, logistical exegesis, where things are happening, why they're happening. There's rational exegesis, which is deductive reasoning. It's not super spiritual, but if this happened, then I can deduct and deduce that that happened. And that allows me to exegetically look at a verse or a text and pull out meaning. So many people who can't rely on the Holy Spirit rely on rational, practical exegesis. And they're not wrong. Because if I look at a text and it says Jesus overthrew the cathedras, he wasn't pleased with it. When the definition of cathedral right here, Webster's Dictionary, is a bishop's official throne. Why would anything defined as a throne be sitting in God's house? How is that not a direct assault to the throne and the majesty of God? What's interesting is so many have so much to say about the Catholic Church, especially charismatic Pentecostals. Oh, y'all talk about the Catholics like a dog. And you embody many of their practices and principles because you, you desire pageantry. You need to feel important. And the vestments and the pageantry and the aura and the all of it all is propping up your little minute, <laughs> low self-esteem issues, inferiority complex. I'm going to call it for what it is. And the reason people have stopped coming to church is not because they don't love God and don't love Jesus. They can see through you. And it's sickening for me to watch you make a processional stop worship. I've been there. Worship high. People getting delivered, set free. I've seen people engaged in a real praise moment and we stop. Stopped it so the bishops could walk in with their wives and take their seat. And you mean to tell me God is okay with that? 
You mean to tell me if God walked in the temple and saw activity and he flipped over tape? You mean to tell me he's still not flipping over tables and chairs? The problem is who's running back behind what he flipped over and propping it back up. And we wonder why the glory has left. We wonder why we're not seeing real deliverance. Deliverance has been reduced to a praise break. Real breakthrough has been reduced to a little two minutes at the altar. Someone lay hands and now you got breakthrough and deliverance. That's why the world is looking at us saying, y'all a joke. It's not because they're angry at God. It's not because they're mad at Jesus and they're being derogatory toward our Lord and Savior. They're looking at the institution that raises itself in pride. We're the only major religion that exists that is always dogging other religions and faiths. I have a lot of friends in a lot of different religious beliefs and persuasions. I have never heard a shaman deliver his, his homily and in the homily, he's dogging Pentecostals and Baptists and Methodists. I've never sat in a temple or synagogue and heard them talking about Kojic and talking about PAW. But in our sermons, we're calling them out. We're sending them to hell. They can't be of God. Yet, when someone speaks about our ills, now our feelings are hurt. Now we crying. They coming against the church. I don't see them talking. Hollywood is not, you know why Hollywood it's not saying much about Muslims. You know why? It's not because they're scared. Are you kidding me? Hollywood didn't have reverence for anybody. But these other religions are focused on making converts. And here we are, can't make real converts without swindling and manipulating them. We're constantly meddling in other religions and faiths and trying to call them out when half of the people who claimed to be full of the Holy Ghost, couldn't even articulate in a debate what they believe. Apologetics is literally non-existent in most churches. Most people don't have a clue what they believe. They cannot discuss soteriology, salvation. They cannot discuss pneumatology. With the advanced education and scientific development that has happened, these terms should be a part of our discipleship with people that we're bringing to Jesus Christ because they're going to have to have discussions and dialogue with other people. And Muslims are learning the catechism of their faith. Buddhists are reciting the catechism of their faith. Jehovah Witness are reciting the catechism of their faith. We can't even agree on how to baptize anybody. And if the women should have pants and makeup on. And so now that's why the world looks at us the way they do. It isn't because they don't want Jesus. They don't want what we have put around Jesus. I'm trying to finish this. Remember when Zacchaeus came to Jesus and the Bible says he was short in stature and he couldn't see Jesus. It says something in the text. It says he couldn't see Jesus for the press. And King James is using that language there, the press, which means there were so many people around Jesus. He was short. He couldn't see over the people. So he climbed up on a tree. Well, when I see press, I think differently because of my background. Press means what people are saying about you. You know, you're right. have you heard my press? Yeah, that's what people are saying about you. And when I look at that text, here's what I see. I read the text this way. Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus because of what was being said about Jesus. And if we're not careful, the press, the representation we give the world about Jesus will make them not be able to see him. And when he couldn't see Jesus by normal means, what did Zacchaeus do? He climbed up a tree. He had to find another way to see Jesus. <laughs> he should have been able to come directly to Jesus, but because of the stuff around Jesus and all the rules that we make and all of the foolishness we put around what it means to be saved and what it means to be anointed, and we put all of this around Jesus, people are having to climb up on trees they should never have to climb on just to get to Jesus. And then we have a problem when people say, I found Jesus at home. I found Jesus 
when I was smoking weed. And he interrupted my cipher and my high in that moment. And he spoke to me. Here come the church. He ain't going to speak to you. God don't bless no mess. God ain't in that. Let me tell you something. If God could create this world, if God can heal you from cancer, God can step into the middle of someone intoxicated and speak to them, save them, deliver them without an altar call and slow music and three people around them saying, come on, give your life to God. We're forcing people to climb up trees and encounter Jesus a different way because of the press. He flipped over cathedras. We order them online to be delivered. He flipped over cathedras. We adorn them. When someone dies, we don't even remove it. No, we drape it. How long will God honor us when we set up what he tore down? I said, God, well, then then what's this com complicit nature of first ladies? And, and he said, he, he said, remember in that movie. And, and, and when I when I played it back, I, I remember the first lady and, and Regina Hall played the part. She is is worthy of some award, Oscar, Golden Globe. Something. I mean, she she played that part and it was it was so it was so real man, and riveting. She did an amazing job. But what caught me was. She's giving this soliloquy and she, she's talking it really more of a monologue and she's talking to her husband and and she's going down the list of the things that she's done and what she's endured and very heart wrenching. But then she says, and th this is what's so powerful about the movie. It sucks you in, but then it and then it hit you because it was trying to show you people can seem so sincere. They'll make you fall in love with them. They'll make you embrace them. They'll make you feel they're the victim. And while she's, and I'm, I was feeling that, I gotta be honest, I was feeling it and feeling what she's saying. And, and, and I've watched wonderful first ladies, don't get me wrong, wonderful first ladies. I've watched them go through a lot of things and, and be abused and all that. But, but part of the issue is the term first lady. It's not biblical, y'all. And some of y'all just itching to be one. <laughs> Please don't. Preachers are crazy. I said it on live global broadcast. Pre male preachers are crazy. <laughs> we got issues. <laughs> that, let, let me clear this up because that'll become a sound bite and then people will be saying, I said all preachers are crazy. Okay, I'm not saying that all of us are crazy. What I'm saying is <laughs> the anointing does not remove our humanity. And I would like to think that after about five years or 10 years as a preacher and a pastor, you work everything out and you reach a level of equilibrium and balance where all things are perfect. No, chances are preacher, pastor, you're going to be working things out until you die <laughs> because this thing is always morphing and evolving. So, so please don't, don't be itching to be a first lady. And I tell you where that term came from. Honestly, it doesn't come from the Bible. And there are people that say, well, the Bible says to the elect lady. Well, the elect lady, if we were actually talking about that, it would be more of a pastor than a pastor's wife. OK, but I don't have time to get into that. But this first lady came from bishops over reformations who saw the president of the United States. And the president of the United States, his wife was called first lady. So men who built little kingdoms and dynasties under themselves said, well, if the president of the United States his wife is called first lady. Well, I'm the president of this reformation. So my wife will be called first lady. It has no biblical basis whatsoever. That's part of the problem. It's an office created that should have never been created. It's a standard set that should have never been a standard set. Well, well, pastor, how should pastor's wives operate like every other woman of God? So now you've got people trying to play a part that, that was never even created by God. So how can God strengthen you for a role he didn't ordain except the Lord build the house? Those that are laboring are laboring in vain. It's not deep, y'all. But she 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 got you. She, she caught, man, she sucked us in. And we were filling her and with tears coming down. And then she says, she says, because I need you to get it together. Why? Why? Why, first lady, to get me back on that stage? 
the tambourine. You almost had me. Regina, I was right there. I was with you. And you revealed this complicit nature of many first ladies. And it isn't talked about. First ladies who make a covenant that my lifestyle that I worked for. See, that's what she started saying. This is my church. This is my church. I sacrificed. I went, this is my church. Ladies who have grown accustomed now to a lifestyle that's on the back of the parishioners based on their husbands. They know their husbands are duplicitous in their lifestyle. They know their husbands prefer another gender over them. A different kind of sexual activity. That was in the movie too. They know improprieties going on. But get me back on that stage because I deserve it after all I went through and after all I put up with. Why were you going through? Why were you putting up? It wasn't for the cause of Christ. No, because you're talking about losing hats and shoes and clothes. So that's not persecution. That's bad business and bad judgment. That's sometimes called harvest. So what persecution have you gone through? First ladies who know children are being abused, who know girls are getting pregnant by their husband and they concoct stories. I know what I'm talking about. They concoct stories and they go out of town and they make young girls go out of town and they make up stories that we had to go get her. She ran away. She didn't run away. She had your husband's baby in another state. You close your eyes and mind. This may be triggering for some. If it is, turn it off. And you turn up the music in your house because of activity going on in the basement. You know when he gets the keys of that car. You know where he's going. You know he's visiting someone at another apartment that you all are paying for. But your response? Get me back on that stage. First lady walked in while the pastor was flirting with the camera guy. The camera guy let him know that he was homosexual and because he said, my boyfriend. And so the pastor knew it. And the pastor who had this affinity toward that touched his face in an endearing way and started being very suggestive with the young man. First lady walks in. She walked past first and she saw it happening. She walks in. He done took his shirt off. She picks up his shirt. She puts the shirt on him. She shows anger. She shows angst. But it wasn't, how could you do that to a soul? It was more, how could you do this to me? First ladies, I don't, I, I'm not trying to be mean to you. But, but please understand that, that God is going to hold you responsible and accountable. For, for the innocence that has been destroyed by your complicit nature to hold on to St. John and Louis Vuitton and to hold on to your, your Gucci and your Fendi. Cain tried to lie to God. I didn't do nothing to Abel. I don't know what you're talking about. And God said his blood is calling out to me from the grave. And there is a sound when innocent blood is shed. No, they're not physically dead, but mentally they've died. Spiritually, they've died. And many churches have a cemetery in the basement. There's a cemetery in the pastor's office. That's where innocence was killed. That's where innocence was slaughtered and complicit pastor's wives, bishop's wives, at the convention, know your husband isn't in the bed with you because he's already at his mistress hotel room and you're fine with it because at least you get to be on the stage. But we are mad at a movie because the movie was a documentary. I got I got to finish this. I got 5 minutes. How are we more angry at a movie than the activities that we continue to see play out in front of us? So I said, "God, okay, let me offer solutions. 
I, I could talk another two hours on this, and I'm going to give give a lot of commentary on a lot of things over the next few weeks. Uh, but but I at least want to, you to hear a different perspective because some of y'all, your ears are bound because you haven't had truth. The Bible says, how can they hear without a preacher? And, and I think when, when we read that scripture, we just see that as, well, the preacher preaches about faith to me, then I get faith. No, because the Bible says faith comes by hearing, 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 hearing. Hearing is what you actually have. It's not just what you do. It's what you have. You have hearing. Okay. You hear because you have hearing. Faith comes by hearing. When my hearing is developed, well, how can they hear without a preacher? Whoever preaches to me develops my hearing. So whatever I hear and how my hearing has been honed is what I'll have faith for. So if I've never been taught truth, I don't have hearing for truth. It sounds foreign to me. It sounds like anger to me. It sounds like I'm an enemy of the church. It's because you've been fed lies or you fed yourself lies for so long, you no longer know truth. You can't hear it when it comes. You get defensive. And maybe it's because you played too long with it. I don't care how long you've been preaching. I don't care how many conferences you threw. I don't care how many people came. I don't even care who got saved. Because in the movie, you know what the preacher kept saying? But I saved you. But you got saved. You don't save anybody, preacher. God does. He uses you, not because of you, in spite of you half the time. People being saved is not the sign God is with you. So I said, God, okay, let, let me talk some solutions. What, what could we do quickly to turn around some of this perspective of how we're viewed by the world? I'm not, I'm not talking now of a spiritual change because that, that's going to require some prophets and some apostles. That's why I'm praying some of you will get energized and some of you will take your rightful place. There are many of you pastors. You're actually called to be an apostle and you, and you don't care about the cathedral and the big rings and that's why you stay away from it. But you're actually called to be a voice in the church and you're actually called to set order and structure. What I'm believing God for, and I've been praying for God to connect me with some other apostles and prophets, I would love to host uh, like they did the Council of Nicaea. I, I would love to host something like that, not for the sake of, of being grand, but for a statement to be made, something that could go down in history. I would love to be a part of this. I don't have to lead it. I would love to be a part of this, that a group of apostles and pastors and prophets all came together and we created a statement of unity of faith, of what it means to be saved biblically that we could leave record for future generations to come to say there was a people who defined and spoke up and declared the word of God without any denominational slant to it. There was no twisting or raping of scripture to, to fit a denominational perspective. It was true line upon line, precept upon precept interpretation of God's word. I would love to see that happen. And I'm believing God that it may be after I'm dead and gone, but I'm believing God that that will rise up. There will be a unified voice of people that will say, it doesn't matter what denomination you're from. There are things we have to agree on and get rid of all this division around things like salvation, y'all. <laughs> I don't care how you jump and shout. Y'all may sing. Y'all may not. Y'all may have an organ. You may not. That's fine. But salvation? Can we agree on that? Can we agree on the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Can we agree on that God is one and stop making God 17 and 18? Y'all, that's the thing God hated. He hated pagan culture because they created all these separate entities to be gods, to be deity. That's why God is one. He kept saying he's one. It's not complicated. He doesn't want to be like any other God. <laughs> so let me get to my solutions before I lose my church. Thank y'all for the hearts. I appreciate it. Here it is. Three simple things I'm going to talk about real quick. 
real quick and I'm out of here. And you may say, well, well, pastor, these aren't that, that heavy. That's the problem with us. <laughs> That's the problem with us. We go heavy and deep and don't go practical. Now, remember what I said, this is not about how do we reform the church. My focus tonight is how do we re-represent Christ and re-represent the church to a culture that's looking at us? Number one, let's turn down the shows of materialism. Okay, we know you have a nice car. Cool. But does it have to be in every reel and story? I drive a nice car. I like nice cars. I like luxury cars. They, they just feel wonderful. <laughs> but, but, but I'm not flaunting that on social media to give me status. You know all I see now? All I see now are the walk-ins to church. You, you, you got the cameraman. Watch me roll up in my, in my whip. Watch me roll up. Show my rims, y'all. Show my rims. Now, don't show the brand of the car because they'll say I'm being too flashy, but but show the leather and show the emblem in the seat and then get me getting out of the car like it's just casual and random. But we know it's not casual or random because you don't start talking until you know they've hit play. And then, and then you get out of the car and you go into church and now we see the walk down to the sanctuary and you walk in the sanctuary and one person does it. And then one person gets a bunch of likes. And then the next thing we know, everybody's doing it. Now people are, everybody's getting out of the car. I told Pastor E, we have a 100% digital church, Apex Everywhere. I told Pastor E, look, I'm going to have to, I mean, I'm going to have to get you to just follow me to the studio. Like, I, I got I to be like everybody else. I need, let, let me let me just, <laughs> let me walk, let me walk to the studio. Let me turn on all my lights and, you know, let me let me get in on this. Is anything original anymore? Like, seriously. I see one person doing it. Now everybody's making the get out of the car as they go into service. Like, really? <laughs> That's the show we give the world about how we arrive to church? Our chauffeur-driven cars? Three people opening the door? We getting out, entourage behind us, carrying all of our stuff. That's the image we give the world to how we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, David said, I'd be a doorkeeper in the house of God. How is this okay to do? But when a movie shows it, Pastors, I'm going to get in trouble right now. I know, I know. Remove your face from everything. <laughs> yeah, I know. Somebody said you lost your church pulling out of the trinity. I know, man. <laughs> Y'all, the trinity, <laughs> it can't be the expression of God because nobody in scripture ever talked about it. Jesus was Jewish. Every disciple was a Jew. All they heard for their bar mitzvah and bar mitzvah is, hear Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. <laughs> Nobody in the church ever said Father, Son, Holy Ghost as an expression of Jesus. They understood the point of the Messiah is God in flesh, God incarnate. That's why Jesus has so much ridicule with the Pharisees. They didn't want to believe he was actually the Messiah. They knew the Messiah was coming. They knew there would be God in flesh. They just wanted him to come with a little bit more pageantry. They wanted him investments. They wanted him with an army. They wanted him to ride in on a, on a, on a warrior horse. They wanted all of them to have positions, which they tried to get. And, and, and here come the mother saying, let my son sit next to you. And, and that's why they rejected him. They rejected him because he was not grand enough. That's how I know if Jesus showed up today, half of the church wouldn't recognize him. Because he would not be in tailor-made suits. He probably wouldn't have on Jordans. He'd probably have New Balance. <laughs> and a hat and a t-shirt. Talking about come follow me. Mm-hmm. Remove your face from everything. Now, now, if you can't, if you're mad at me because I'm saying it, be mad at me. But, but trust, 
trust my experience in doing what I do in branding and marketing. Because remember, I'm trying to help us re-represent ourselves to the world. One of the classic signs of narcissism is when your face is on everything. As we saw in that movie, the pastor's face was everywhere, literally everywhere. Pastor, I know that it seems the model is put my face on it so people know I'm the pastor. Why? Can I tell you a secret? Okay, you guys, this is from market research. This Come out of the heavenlies for a second. This is market research. Your face on everything screams narcissist. That's a trigger for some people. There are some people that will never come to your church that were meant to come and bless you because they see your face on every flyer. Kids ministry, your face. Youth ministry, your face. Women's ministry, you got a picture of the woman, your face in the background like you overseeing. Conference, your face. Men's ministry, your face. And I know why many of you do it. Many of you do it because you like looking at yourself. You like that feeling of importance that this is something you've built, especially if you're a church planter. I get it. And you want people to know, and that flyer, man, with your picture on it, that's dope. I know. I know. I used to do it until I learned better. I used to do all this, man. Back in the day, I used to do all of it. I was a king of graphics when y'all was calling me worldly and carnal. <laughs> but when you put your face on everything, you're screaming, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And you get the fresh fit. You got the tight, you know, fade and and, and your woman's looking good. Or, or if you're a lady pastor, you're, you're decked out and you look amazing. But your face on everything is sending a message to the world. Honk for Jesus. It doesn't matter how you hold your hands inviting. It doesn't matter how you smile. Your face on everything is honk for Jesus. It looks like a gimmick. And if we could step back for a second and ask ourselves, how am I representing Jesus to the culture? We'd probably find out we were never trying to represent Jesus to the culture. We were representing us to the culture. And you know why I'm showing myself getting out of the car and making it so cool and so fly? Because I want the culture to see me. We rationalize and tell ourselves, well, no, because if they see me and they want to be like me, then I can tell them about Jesus. Y'all know it doesn't work that way. How about letting them see that we're so well adjusted, that we're so mature, that money is nothing new to us, that we don't have to flash it. I've got wealthy friends. I know people that got a lot of money and they don't wear Gucci belts. They just don't. <laughs> they don't have whole Fendi jackets. They, they just don't. They have nothing to prove. So pastors, please, if you want to see your marketing and branding be effective, put real photos if you can. If you don't have real photos, use stock photos. All right? But use photos of people connected to whatever it is you're talking about. Get your face off of every flyer. You can put it on some, don't get me wrong. Now, personal branding, now let me just say this. For those of you that have a business, you're a coach, and, and you, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking church here, okay? No, for your personal business, put your face on everything if you want to. That, that's, that's just part of a, a good strategy for people to see you. But I'm talking church here because church is not my business. I'm not the CEO of church. No, no. I'm managing director at best, but the CEO is Jesus Christ. It would be like you're the CEO of your company and somebody you hire starts putting out flyers for the company and they put their face on every flyer. Pastor, that's what it is. You're not the CEO of the church. I don't care if you started it. You, you just started a vineyard of Jesus Church. He's the CEO. Your face on everything sends the wrong message. Lastly, make ministry missional and not sensational. I'm trying to help you with how we could literally get the world to start looking at us differently. If we make our church experience missional, ask yourself this question, Pastor, and ask, ask yourself, ask your staff, do this before Sunday if you can, ask them, what is our mission this Sunday? We used to do this church. Uh, I planted in Lexington, Kentucky. We used to do this. We would pull all the leaders together 
And before we did anything, we would pause and, and, and sometimes God would tell me, other times I would ask and I would see what was on the heart of those that are, that were leading with me. But we always started every Sunday, the revolution That's what it was called in, in Lexington. And we started with what is the mission today? And I would encourage the worship leaders. I would encourage the worship team. Find somebody in the audience that you're going to minister to from the stage. Don't let that person out of your focus. And the reason I would do that is so many times we're dealing with so many things in inner conflict when we're doing ministry that in ministry moments, it's easy for us to get to get sidetracked in that ministry moment and make it about us. So then we start singing ourselves happy. We start singing ourselves through something. And the problem with that is the ministry moment isn't meant for you to self-medicate because Jesus didn't on the cross. Jesus is dying, but he turned and gave life to the thief next to him. Your anointing is not for you. So there are moments where you need to focus on an object that you're directing your ministry to so that it doesn't become self-serving. Because if I'm focused on that person in row three and I'm singing for breakthrough to happen in their life, I'm not going to start showboating because I'm not getting the response out of the crowd. And we would do this every single week. And what it did, it brought a mission to what we did. And the question we would ask is, this is what we have planned for today. Now, based on the mission that all of us have agreed to, is there anything that's on our flow of service or flow of worship that we need to change? And you know, there were Sundays that we had to go back and change the order of things. There were Sundays that the message needed to change because we understood in that moment, there was agreement in the spirit. Here's the mission today. And God would speak to me and say, preach this. And we saw our church go through growth like crazy. I mean, it was unprecedented growth. It was crazy. We were doing, we sent out not one postcard. In all my years of pastoring, I've sent out direct mailers twice. <laughs> and churches that we planted, they would just grow. Now, I had all kind of crazy stuff would happen, man. My journey's been crazy. But the churches would grow because we understood. Don't make the aim sensation, make it missional. Now, here's what happens, though. When people encounter the, the authentic presence of Jesus, when there's a sense of community, when the culture is a safe space, you know what happens? Sensation happens. Because now I'm able to feel. And I know it's safe for me to be vulnerable in my feelings here. So people started having sensational experiences with Jesus, not the church. If we could capture that, <laughs> repackage that, release that to the world, and the world would see, turn down some of the materialism. Nothing wrong with being fly now. I love being fly. Pastor E loves being fly. We got the sauce on us, man. <laughs> but if we, could, if we could turn down, though, our projection of that as pastors, apostles, bishops, let people be introduced to our authenticity rather than our outfit. We get our faces off everything and show that we will launch you from our church, that our church is a launching pad. It's a trajectory creator. So you're going to see other pastors face on the flyer. You're going to actually see our children's pastors face on the flyer. It's youth Sunday. The youth pastor's face is going to be on the flyer and no pastor, your name doesn't have to be on there. Just put the youth pastor's name. Let them have it for that Sunday. Because see, what you're creating is a culture that says I'm not threatened and intimidated. And I know this. I know this. That if we could present that to this generation, along with sound biblical teaching, take them into levels of discourse that engages their brilliant minds, if we could speak to the political nature of our country, speak to ageism, speak to sexism and nepotism, speak 
to the, the injustice that we see and the social unrest, white supremacy, if we could speak to that and engage our generation and then apply these three things as quickly as possible, I promise you the next movie wouldn't be Honk for Jesus. The next movie may actually be an applause for what and who the church has become in this present day. I'm Larry Weathers, <laughs> and I approve this message, and I pray that you do too. Thank you for hanging out with me. This has been a wonderful time of engagement. I see the comments, man. I'm going to go back and look at all of them. I read the last one, uh, the last broadcast, and I read the comments. Man, you guys are so incredible. Thank y'all. I see some of y'all in here cutting up. And man, I got some friends in here. My goodness, so good to see y'all. Thank y'all for hanging up. Is that, man, Bishop, come on, somebody. Billy is in the house. One of my dear friends, great church, great pastor. You want to talk about somebody doing it right? He's a bishop, ordained, bishop in the Lord's church. But you want to talk about somebody that carries that in proper perspective and loves what he does and deserves to have that that title and position. Man, you you are one. You've always been one. I, I don't, this ain't something I have never told him. I've told him privately and I try to support what he does. Great man of God. Now I'm calling you out, man. Don't mean to put you on the spot, but but you are you are one of those examples that we need to see more of. And and can I get everybody to agree with me that the voices uh, that are raising up, uh, I've seen another good friend of mine. Where you at? I just saw you. I just saw you. I thought I saw you. Maybe not. Maybe not. I thought I saw you. Where you at? Walters. There you are. Bless you, Walters. <laughs> Powerful woman of God. Tantalel Walters. Y'all see her? Powerful woman of God. And, and you know what? I may have butchered your name because I always call you Walters. So if I, <laughs> I've known you for several years. So if I, if I did, I apologize, T. <laughs> Powerful woman of God. She hosts conferences and conclaves and just, just heavy and anointing scholarship. I'm telling you, there, but can, we, can we agree, though? Can, can, will y'all come and agree with me? I'm getting ready to quit. I'm 18 minutes over. Can we agree tonight that God is going to amplify and magnify voices? No, don't don't pray that for me. I'm good. But but can we can we can we decree and declare tonight, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus that God will amplify and magnify authentic real voices that cannot be bought or bribed. Individuals that have been carved out of crucibles of conflict, chaos, confusion, hurt, pain, but they mastered it. Can, can we believe God that the next set of conferences, hey PV, good to see you, man. The next set of conferences will not be sensational, but missional. That if there's no praise break, there was break in psychotic disorders. Because we had someone on stage who's a mental wellness expert, who's full of the Holy Spirit and can take the Holy Spirit with the language of mental wellness and minister that people are falling out, not because of sensation. We were missional and we accomplished our mission. Can we, can we agree in Jesus name? Father, we agree right now and we thank you that even though this movie caused controversy, it has lifted some very important things that are happening in our country and our world around this space we call church. Father, I'm decreed and declaring right now that there's some even on this broadcast and others that are gonna come back and view this later, whose name, reputation, character, and essence of persona is going to be brought before the masses in a great way. And they will not become someone different when the light hits them. I thank you for the authenticity they will re retain and I thank you for the courage they will never let be taken from their mouth and taken from their spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, <laughs> amen, amen. Listen, I love y'all. Thank God for you. 
continue to pray for uh, this this show, man. Just uh, just a small thing I'm doing, not on a real large scale, but I am happy that I have a voice and that I can lend it to Jesus. I'll do my best to give you a quality production every time that you tune in to the best of my ability. I try to have my graphics. Y'all see that come down? Y'all, I need y'all to celebrate me. See, y'all got to y'all got to pump me up. So I feel good about myself. Did y'all see how my graphics came in? Watch this. You ready? You looking? Bam. You see that? It came in hot. There's smoke. <laughs> but but I enjoy <laughs> making sure that if you're going to spend time with me, that it's aesthetically pleasing, that, that it's something good to look at. And I'm not asking you for money, okay? I'm just asking you for prayer. And call my name out before God when you think about it. And you ain't got to say pastor, apostle, bishop, prophet. Just say, Lord, bless Larry. And he knows me by my name. God bless you this evening. Thank you for watching. This is it. You know, Larry Weathers Live, where we always keep it real, relevant, and raw. Have an amazing evening and a better tomorrow. How are you going to have it? In and on purpose. That's it. On the way we do it. I'll talk to you soon. Have a great evening. It's been great tonight. Bye-bye.